Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I'm your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. Uh, so, tell folks, Judy, our uh, title for today's episode. Sacred Sexuality and Sexual Communion, an interview with Satya Leela. Yeah, we just finished that interview, and I invite you to stay tuned. It was really interesting. And, you know, people uh, checking us out, especially recently, would think, oh, this is a podcast about Tantra, isn't it? There we go. <laughs> it isn't really. It's a podcast that includes pretty much anything to do with couples, and it just mm -hmm. so happens that the, the previous episode to this one and this one are both with Tantra people. Mm -hmm. And isn't that interesting? Just yeah. kind of... It happens. It happens. It just yeah, sort of happened that way. Something in the air. Maybe Indeed. the Tantra things are moving. <laughs> that must be what it is. And, and it's, it's lovely. It's really lovely stuff. It so I, I do invite you to check it out. Um, before that, let's just briefly put in a word for, you know, if, if those of you watching can see over my left shoulder uh, a couple of my books. Why don't you tell folks the, the name of a couple of my Isn't books? Is that your right shoulder? Well, it's my left shoulder. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're seeing it on the right, but oh. it's my left shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a couple of books that we are uh, that we've been plugging away, both of them by you. One is Reigniting the Spark: Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back, and it's not about communication. Why everything uh, you know about <laughs> uh, about, about couples therapy <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's like too much stuff in my head going yeah, on here. <laughs> indeed. And while we're on the subject of books that one of us have written, gee, maybe we'll mention our sponsor. Ah, uh, yes, our sponsor. Yes. The Blue Tent, Erotic Tales from the Bible by Laria Zilber. By Laria Zilber, who just happens to be... Me. Yes. That's right. That's, That's my uh, publishing pseudonym. Judy's pseudonym. Uh, and it's a beautiful book. And why well, we, we just did a, you know, you'll see in the interview talking about tantric ways of connecting. And mm -hmm. I will say, uh, reading really sensual and sensuous and well-written erotica mm -hmm. can be a lovely thing for couples to it do. certainly can. And uh, that particular book that you wrote, I would say, qualifies. It certainly does. That's <laughs> another way to reignite that spark. It is, absolutely. <laughs> uh, one other thing, one other plug to make before we turn to our interview, I would invite people, well, two, two. <laughs> I have to say two. One is to sign up for my newsletter, Dr. Chalmers' newsletter. You can do that right from our podcast website, ctn7.com. And I also am asking people for their stories about betrayal. I am working on a book currently. I'm in the middle of writing it. Uh, the working title, I think we decided to switch around the Faith and Forgiveness, didn't we? It's Betrayal, Forgiveness, and Faith. That is the um, working title of the book currently. Uh, so any stories you have about betrayal and I was going to say especially, but whether or not um, it, you ended up being able to forgive it. Uh, I'm interested in all of that. So mm -hmm. you've gotten a few really good stories. So I far, I so have indeed. We'd like to have some more. Yeah, folks have been responding to this. Yeah. And how can you get in touch with me? You might ask. Just go to ctn7.com. There's a way to send us a message, and that's probably the simplest way to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, without further ado, let's go to our interview. Our guest today is Satya Leela. Satya has taught people about sacred sexuality for over 30 years. She has seen thousands of clients and led hundreds of workshops all over the United States and in Japan. As the founder of the Sexual Communion Program, Satya specializes in helping women and couples to enhance their intimate connection, to allow the erotic divine energies to move through them, to feel the ecstatic bliss of a sacred sexual connection, and enjoy epic earth-shattering lovemaking. Satya, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate your presence and your uh, hosting this. Well, it's great to have it's you. It's a pleasure. So we always like to start with our guests asking, how did you get into the work you do? Tell us something about your own journey into this. Okay. Um, well, um, I was in my 30s when I got into this work. Uh, I was in a relationship that was really be becoming a struggle. Uh, it, it had all, actually, it was always a struggle, <laughs> if I want to be honest. 
uh, I realized later that w I was with him so I could learn how to express anger. <laughs> 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 could, could learn things from any any situation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes the the harder situations push you to do it. But we had um, a major disconnect when it came to sexuality, and I'd always been a really sexual being, and I uh, my energy was too much for him. And I kind of stifled it down. It was scary for him later, um, 20 years later, he told me that it was his stuff and that, uh, you know, he was afraid of my sexual energy, but he wasn't even aware of that at that time. Um, but I was trying to make myself smaller so that I could meet him because yeah. I really wanted to meet him. And um, that wasn't working very well. I was really miserable. And we found our way to a Tantra workshop. We were living in Marin County, California, which was, this was like in the early 90s. And um, Tantra was just starting to become known in the West. And Marin was one of the centers of where it, it sprung up. And um, I just happened to be living there and found my way into it and there was something about it that made me feel like I had come home it was just uh, it was I remember having the thought wow a spiritual path that includes sexuality I can't believe it this is so for me you know and he and I went to one workshop and we had a beautiful connection and I think it scared him because we never went back again and um, we eventually broke up in a, a, about another year after that. And um, I started exploring Tantra on my own and um, quickly dove in into a kind of loose-knit community of people who were practicing Tantra, uh, connected with a couple of long-term partners. Um, it was... It was a wonderful wild time it was very experimental very um yes was was the word you know you want to do this yes you know <laughs> try just kind of like um exploring um the edges exploring the wildness exploring um possibilities mm. uh and I remember reading a book uh, uh, written by a tantric master whose name is Osho. He used to be Rajneesh, and it was called From Sex to Superconsciousness. And the main theme of the book was um, that you can't transcend sexuality in your spiritual practice. You have to, you can't just rise above it. You have to go through it so it loses its hold and its charge because of the culture that we live in that is so highly um, charged around sexuality that um, that we we just by growing up in this culture we, we receive a lot of wounding and and we have a distorted uh, attitude towards sexuality and so his answer was live it out live out your fantasies live out your dreams your desires until they lose their charge and they don't have a hold on you. And um, I remember reading that and I was like, well, I am leave, living out my fantasies, but I don't want to lose that charge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was right. I did actually lose it. And it was a good thing to lose it because uh, where it, it wasn't really a loss. It was a, it was a drop. It was a dropping away of something that held me tight that held, you know that um i felt out of, a little out of control with it mm -hmm. and by um um by i'm not sure if out of control is the right word but i'll let that go <laughs> uh, anyway uh, I, it it did sex became a normal part of life mm -hmm. just a beautiful part of life. I I never lost my appreciation for it and the ecstatic bliss 
that I learned how to access during the days when I was in that tantric community has stayed with me and is still there. But it, um, one of my teachers has talked about orgasm being a glimpse of enlightenment. Mm. And uh, I figure uh, learning the techniques of extended orgasm and being in orgasmic energy for um, a half an hour or an hour or several hours at a time is a big glimpse of enlightenment. Mm. And uh, it, it really shifted my whole spiritual um, connection mm. in, in a very profound way. This, so this, go this ahead. sounds like a, a good time to segue into the a question, like, what do you mean by sacred sexuality? You know, listeners to this podcast might know uh, one of my books, actually the book that sort of started this podcast, as we call it, uh, called Reigniting the Spark. I have a chapter in there called Sex, Good Sex, and Sacred Sex. And so I've written uh -huh. some about, you know, what, what I'm thinking of as sacred sex. And, but I'm curious, like, how do you understand that term? And, you know, what is sacred sexuality? What makes it different from plain old sexuality or even good sexuality? How do you understand that? Uh, well, sacred sex is bringing the attitude of worship into the sexual connection. Mm -hmm. And the, the worship can span a lot of different ways uh, you can worship the god or the goddess within your partner's body. You can view them as a vessel for divine spirit, and each touch of their body is an act of worship and devotion. Um, and uh, I love doing that. I love invoking um, divine goddess energy to flow through me and bless my partner with that energy. And it's also, um, Sacred sex is a pathway to union with the divine. I've had experiences where uh, I've um, been in sexual union with my partner and um, the, the energy uh, gets so big that I've flipped into uh, what the yogis call a samadhi experience, a union with the divine, where my experience was um, that I, I had a vision of my yoni being a portal to, yoni is the Sanskrit word for vagina, um, my yoni being a portal to the divine energy. And I saw a, sh a shape of a yoni in gold on a black background with rays of light coming out from it. And then the next moment I flipped into just floating in this field of infinite light and love and bliss and it was it was timeless and ec ecstatic and beautiful and holy and sex was the catalyst to um activate that experience yeah so you work with couples and and individuals so um mm -hmm. certain techniques that you teach people where they can get to that place or is it yes general mindset or how does that work uh it's both the mindset is really important and um it's probably the most important part because the techniques actually um after a little some they can be a little awkward at first to learn it's kind of like learning to ride a bicycle at first you're thinking about balancing and steering and braking and don't hit that tree and, and uh, after a while you get on the bike and ride and enjoy the wind in your hair and the sun on your face and it's a whole different experience sure. and the same is true for the techniques that i teach they they include um, movement and breath practices that help to circulate the sexual energy from the pelvis through the rest of the body so that it becomes a whole full body experience instead of being localized in the genitals. Mm. And um, that, that sends you into a, a kind of altered state that makes this experience more likely to happen, this, this union kind of experience. It makes it... Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a happy accident when um, when it happens, but it makes it more. You may 
you get more accident prone if mm-hmm. you practice these. Uh, it, you know, that's a Osho quote too. I have I can't take credit for that. I, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that that notion that any sort of spiritual practice facilitates some kind of peak experience. It doesn't yeah. force it because you, by the very nature of peak experience, you can't force it. Yes. And you can, indeed, you can make yourself accident prone. I, I love that. I love that. Concept. Yeah. <laughs> That's really nice. So you, one of the things you're, um, you call your program sexual communion. Mm-hmm. That has a sort of, uh, did you, did you choose that term sort of to resonate with a kind of, particularly among Catholics, I guess we're Jewish, but you know, I, I certainly understand the word communion and among Catholics, it has a very, very deep spiritual meaning. I'm curious, you know, how did you choose that term? That's a good question. I never actually thought about Catholics until you brought that up just now. <laughs> I just chose it because it is uh, wor- working with these practices is like a communion with the divine yeah. and um, a communion with your partner and with the divine, uh, with yourself as well. So I just, I, I chose it because it evokes the, the holy connection but i never i never was i wasn't thinking about the christian uh you know catholic or protestant both do communion they do yeah and as an outsider to it and you know i've i'm uh yeah respectful outsider i've you know i'm jewish and we 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 are actively jewish so we Mm -hmm. would sort of christian communion kinds of things but when i've been to church services and seen it happen it's fascinating. And again, the, the Catholics particularly, it may be Anglican or Episcopal to some extent, more than most of the Protestants, it's this, um, you know, transubstantiation. It's this deeply real to them uh, mm-hmm. encounter with God. You know, they are they are mm-hmm. consuming God, which right. is an astonishing thing. And I, I'm which just... That's why that seems to fit in with uh, the sexual community. Yeah, exactly. It's this very right. physical manifestation of a deeply spiritual experience yes yes yeah thanks for pointing that out i appreciate that sure yeah yeah you know you mentioned uh, the the orgasm is sort of a um a little uh in in uh, talmudic terms they would call it the 60th part of enlightenment <laughs> i just made that up but i mean the, the, you know jewish in uh, traditional jewish sources they'll talk about something like sleep is the 60th part of death you know or the sabbath is the 60th part of heaven you know it's like a little bit of something amazing you know and so that notion of orgasm being a little bit of enlightenment, I, I noted that when I was writing about sacred sex as well, you know, anything can be sacred. You can have yes. dishwashing. It's yes. just the experience of orgasm in particular is so powerful for most people that, you know, it's an experience that most people, when they're able to, to have that, it's clearly bigger than yourself, you know? Yes. So it invites a, a sense of the sacred, I think. Does that sort of fit with how you understand it? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, orgasm is, um, uh, well, all the senses really are a part of sacred sexuality. And uh, orgasm is is one part of it. But at the same time, another aspect of sacred sexuality is not being goal centered mm-hmm. on the orgasm yeah of course yeah it's um you know it's it's about cherishing each moment um and th- that in itself is a spiritual practice yeah um being present being in the moment mm-hmm. slowing it down um so that one little touch can resonate through your body like a pebble thrown in a pond rippling out. I I love slowing things down so that um, I can feel the ripples, ripple, 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 ripple. And that makes each touch more and more exquisite. Mm. So um, I I, I used to be, when I first got into Tantra, um, I used to... um, be more focused on the orgasm but af- after a while i i got into the the aspect of the slowness and the stillness and letting letting the energy build and build slowly when you build it slowly it builds so much bigger that when you do go into orgasmic energy it's a really um 
a hugely expansive experience. I think that's uh, I would I would note as as the the heterosexual male in the conversation. Um, that's what that's especially challenging for men. I think. Yes. Learn that, and of course, also fascinating for men to learn, as I'm sure you know, the uh, that orgasm and ejaculation are not equivalent. Yes. <laughs> they can be separate physiological processes and can yes. be separated. And when they are, it can be very, very powerful. It's it's one of the. You know, mm -hmm. it's, oh wow. We could have orgasms like you women do. <laughs> <laughs> I know, isn't that great? Yeah. Uh, yes, I've I've seen many men be in orgasmic energy for like a half an hour, mm -hmm. and it's not yeah, it's not the peak kind of experience. It's more, it's called a valley orgasm where there's rises and falls that you go in and out of orgasmic energy, um, uh, but you don't go uh, over into ejaculation. Or for a woman, you don't go over into a strongly clitor clitorally focused orgasm because the, the clitoris will burn out and get too sensitive. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you if you just visit it every once in a while and then go away again, it um, it builds the energy um, in the rest of the body mm -hmm. to a much higher peak. So. When you are when you meet a couple, let's say, and so we're we're focused on couples therapy here. Yeah. You meet a couple, and this is a very general question, but what do you do with them? Like, how does it you know how does it work when people consult you? It really depends on what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. um, I look at the whole relationship because sex is not isolated from the rest of the relationship. The whole relationship is in the bedroom. And so I look at um, what's how, what's their relationship like? Are, are they happy? Are they struggling? Is, has there been a betrayal? Is there a lack of trust? You know, just what what um, healing the wounds um, of the couple and also the individual. Sometimes I work individually with people as well as together because sometimes. People have had a history of sexual abuse or just, uh, you know, di uh, different kinds of upbringings that, uh, you know, they have individual issues as well as the couple issues. So I, I look at, at um, what, what are they bringing into with their history and the, the history of their relationship. And then I look at skills. Uh, do they know techniques of lovemaking do they know the the different like for example the difference between men and women's responses and uh, how to work with matching those up how like for example men um, are more genitally focused and women are more heart focused in general that's a general gross generalization and um, i i don't apply it to everyone but in general that that um is true how do you how do you make that meet in a happy way so that um, the woman's um, genitals get lit up and the men's hearts get lit up instead of the shutdown because you're not meeting in the same place how do you light each other up and yeah. so so that you're bringing something uh to each other that benefits each other mm -hmm. so uh, so looking at yeah, you know, I call it the nuts and bolts of sexuality. Like, don't go straight for the nipples. You know, <laughs> touch the side of the body first, or you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And um, and I teach um, breathing techniques um, that come from tantra and and yoga mm -hmm. to um, move the energy through the body and uh, awaken the whole body. And uh, sometimes I guide couples through a interaction. Often I do that, actually, um, um, where they're looking at each other in the eyes, and I guide them into a deeper, intimate connection with breath and eye gazing. Mm. And um, um, sometimes I'll t teach people to touch 
uh, how, how to touch, how to, how to be present in their hands when they're touching. Mm. Um, it's, it's, those are the main things that I use. Mm-hmm. Um, it's varied with different people, of course. You know, it's interesting to me to hear as you describe it, because, you know, as a couples therapist, there, someone consulting you knows they're going to learn about sex, right? I mean, that's yeah. listed in, the, in showing up at a sexual communion program, you know? Yeah. It's fascinating because you were saying, yeah, there's some couples where there's been betrayal and there's a lot of distrust and, and a lot of anger and hurt and stuff like that, which I, I imagine is true even for the folks who come to you. Mm-hmm. The, the difference, I think, in your experience and in, in much of my experience with couples is that lots of couples come to me as a couples therapist, not specifically a sex therapist, and they're having whatever issues they're having. And for many of them, they've so closed off any sort of sexual possibilities, even though, mm-hmm. you know, it, it isn't necessarily about sexual abuse. Sometimes, of course, that's an issue. But even if it isn't, it's like, well, I'm sexual, but I can't imagine being sexual with him or with her. You know, it's uh-huh. they're, they've closed off that avenue as a way toward healing. It's fascinating uh-huh. to me to imagine, you know, going to someone like you where it's clear you're going to be using sex as part of your healing. You know, mm-hmm. some touch or some kind of connection other than just arguing <laughs> or even other than just hearing each other. You know, mm-hmm. there's some physicality involved because with a lot of the folks I work with, that's we, we have to work toward that. Uh-huh. And, and it's amazing when it happens, when people who come in and they're, they've so drifted apart, it's so dangerous for them to go near touch because it'll turn into, you know, one of them being disappointed and the other being pressured, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they yeah. avoid it. And when they get past that and say, well, let's not exclude that as a way of connecting, then they often discover that a lot of things just loosen up. Yeah. So it's just yeah. interesting to me that, you know, yeah, I can imagine folks, if I referred some folks to you, they would look at me like I have three heads because it's like, you got to be kidding. We're nowhere near doing anything with sex. But I imagine uh-huh. people who consult you are at least open to considering that maybe that's a pathway to healing. Yes, yes, yes. I often say to people, um, if you've just had a great orgasm, you're really not too concerned about your partner left the dishes in the sink. Uh-huh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's sort of the definition of a great orgasm, isn't it? It's one where you're not too concerned about whether your partner left the dishes. That's, that's a great way of saying, well, how do you know if you had a great orgasm or just meh? You know, meh, so worried about the dishes. You know, great. You know. I like that. What else should we be asking you about? Um, sexual energy. Hmm. Please tell us Sex, about that. Sexual energetics uh, is a really fascinating topic. Uh, it, it's um, it, it's um, based on the, the, the idea that the body is an energetic system as well as a physical system. And the, the, when I talk about sexual energy, I talk about uh, what I'm talking about is something that acupuncturists and Taoists call chi, uh, Aikido masters call it ki, uh, yogis call it kundalini energy, and tantrikas call it kundalini. Um, and it's all the same energy, just different names for it. And there are pathways through the body that um, the energy moves. The main pathway uh, is starts at the perineum, and it goes up through the center of the body, right along the spinal column, up to the top of the head, and then out the top of the head. And and then there are a couple of spiral path, um, smaller pathways that spiral around it. It looks like the medical symbol, the caduceus, mm. the serpents twining around the snake, which I th- think the AMA would be horrified to know that they adopted. <laughs> Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is I did, some in the AMA would, and some wouldn't, oddly enough. Yeah, that's true. There's some that's folks, true. you know, in the traditional medical community that are quite open to other, you know, other understandings, other metaphorical ways of talking about stuff. Yes, you, you are absolutely right. And I know many doctors who are really great and very open. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, so many of these practices come out of the East rather than the West. Yes. 
mentioned the ki, the chi, the kundalini, the tantra. Those are all Eastern thoughts. Yes. Philosophies. Yes. I don't think we have much of an equivalent here in the West, do we? No, I mean, you, you can there is. things that remind you of it. Yeah. But it's certainly not so as central. Why, yeah, yeah. So why do you think that is? Um, well, first I want to say there there is a um, sacred sexuality that the Cherokee Indians practiced. Mm. Uh, it's called Kwadoshka. I've mm. done uh, a couple of workshops with Kwadoshka. Kudoshka. I, I don't consider myself an authority on it altogether, but they do a practice uh, where they circulate the energy between the different chakras, um, which are the energy centers that are located along the spine. So it, they, they are, that's the only Western um, originate, you know, there's Western Tantra, but it came from the East. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, there's such a difference between um, the materialism of the West and the mysticism of the East mm -hmm. that, you know, I think it just is an uh, outgrowth of that. I don't know why. Uh, I think the West, us Westerners have really hugely benefited from the influx of Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know why we didn't go there ourselves, um, but... Um, I suppose I could speculate, you know, that it's sort of a combination of, uh, you know, like Christianity right. and its separation it's the between the physical and, right, <laughs> yeah. and the spiritual. Oh, yes. And of also course. Uh, Descartes, you know, the body and the mind being separate. Yeah. You know, I think, therefore, I am, as opposed to I touch, therefore, I am, or yes. uh, you know, all, all sorts of other possibilities. But yeah. Descartes went with, no, it's all about what you're thinking. Yeah. Oh, you know, I think that tended to separate us from our physicality. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Did you find among, like, among, in, in Kabbalah, there are some currents, you know, Jewish mysticism. And also, I think there are some elements of Christian mysticism that will also okay. go there, but it's certainly not mainstream for either mm -hmm. Christians or Jews. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I was just thinking about that when you were talking about all the different practices and where they sprung from. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so how can people get in touch with you um you can go i have a, a link tree uh address it's called uh link tree link tree um and it's got a funny little dot in it l-i-n-k-t-r dot e e slash satya lila and that's l-i-l-a sexual communion it's all one word, Satya Leela, Sexual Communion. And it should be in the notes about this podcast. I will put that there. And of course, they can also just search for you, search for your name, which is how I found your website when I was looking for it to check some things out. Great, so great. Satya, S-A-T-Y-A-L-I-L-A. -L -L so look for Satya Leela and, and people will find you that way, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, yeah. And those, um, that, that has um, links to whatever offers I'm currently um, pre presenting, uh, whatever classes I'm doing. It has a lot of free stuff on there, including a free sexual communion gateway session where I help you look at where you are in your, uh, in your own uh, practice and see where you want to go and give you some recommendations of how to get there. You also do workshops? I do. I'm um, currently preparing to start a, a three-month online women's group. Uh, it's going to start in February, and I do that from time to time. I do couples groups sometimes, women's groups sometimes. Okay. Most of it online at this point. Online, so that's uh, so so available from any place. Be <laughs> yeah. With you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, too. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Satya Leela and her interesting Tantra messages. So we're just going to wrap up uh, with just a couple of quickies here, one being uh, buy our books. <laughs> <laughs> I got some. Judy's got some under the name Laria Zilber. Uh, and also uh, any stories you have about betrayal. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for those. 
and oh let's mention our uh, merch yes our merch we've got merch right. um and uh you can find that at ctn7.com as well that clunk you heard for those of you just hearing the audio of this was our clunking together our beautiful couples therapy in seven words mugs mm -hmm. in the 15 and 11 ounce sizes they are just lovely and they have our seven words which we been through this whole episode and haven't said what the seven words are. Judy, tell people what the seven words are. Be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Be kind, don't panic, and have faith. And so, and that's how we always uh, how conclude, we end isn't our it? Podcast. And so, until next time, remember: be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Bye.